The UK is one of the most heavily surveyed areas in the world. According to the latest figures, the UK has around 5 million CCTV cameras, one for every 14 people. CCTV may feel like an intrusion of privacy, but sometimes these CCTV clips may even solve a case. Number 5. The disappearance of 33-year-old Sarah Everard from Brixton, London, England shocked the nation. Sarah was a sweet and kind young woman who worked as a marketing executive in the heartland of South London. Her disappearance sparked rallies and protests by other women who felt that they were no longer safe on the streets of London. Sarah's case would take a shocking turn when a surprise arrest was made and the damning CCTV evidence was released. Sarah Everett had lived across the UK and attended the prestigious Durham University before moving to Brixton Hill, London. Her family described her as a happy and bright young woman who had a large group of friends. She was also in a happy relationship with her boyfriend and the two were looking forward to their future together. The bizarre mystery began on March 3, 2021, when Sarah left her friend's home on Lethwaite Road in Clapham, London at around 9 p.m. Sarah planned to make the 50-minute walk back to her home in Brixton to relax and wind down. Her boyfriend anxiously awaited her arrival, but when 10 p.m. came and there was no sign of Sarah, he felt something was amiss. He desperately tried to call her, but there was no answer. After failing to contact Sarah, he called her family and her friends, but nobody had seen or heard from her after she left Clapham that evening. Sarah's boyfriend and family waited until morning, but there was still no sign of her. Hours after she was last seen, Sarah was reported missing to the Metropolitan Police, and the search was on. Detectives with the Met Police began retracing Sarah's steps and found some interesting CCTV images of her. They confirmed that after leaving her friend's home, Sarah had walked through the Clapham Common tube station in the direction of her home in Brixton. Moreover, other CCTV images from a ring doorbell camera captured Sarah walking along the A205 Pointers Road just south of a Brixton home. After this, the trail went cold. Sarah's disappearance made news headlines across the UK, and her missing person posters could be seen in every corner of London. The media pushed the Metropolitan Police to find Sarah and resolve the case, but as days passed, hope began to fade. Her friends and family made several emotional appeals to the person who had taken Sarah, but it was to no avail. For days, the UK held their breath, Many women and men took to the streets to advocate for women's safety and held candlelit vigils to light the way for Sarah. Behind the scenes, the Metropolitan Police were working hard to uncover the truth about Sarah's disappearance and had a chance piece of evidence that would shock everyone. According to The Guardian, CCTV from a passing bus along the route Sarah was walking home showed her standing beside a white rental car. While the picture was shaky, investigators were able to track the license plate and discover who had rented it. At first, the Metropolitan Police didn't want to believe the evidence in front of them. But as the minutes ticked by, reality began to set in. Wayne Cousins, a Metropolitan Police officer, had kidnapped Sarah Everard. By March 9, 2021, the Metropolitan Police Department had announced that one of their own officers had been arrested in connection with the disappearance of Sarah Everett. Public concern turned to public outcry, and then protests amped up. The British public were both shocked and concerned to learn that a police officer, someone who is employed to protect the public, had been the mastermind behind this shocking crime. After tracing the rental car spotted in the CCTV footage, the Metropolitan Police followed Wayne's trail and discovered that he'd been prowling the streets for most of the evening. Detectives revealed that while Wayne wasn't on duty, he pulled Sarah to one side, showing her his badge. According to the BBC, he told her she was under arrest for breaching COVID guidelines and bundled her into what he called his undercover car. From here, Wayne drove Sarah to Hodes Wood, where he took her life. Days after Sarah disappeared, her body was discovered in Hodes Wood an area that Wayne had visited several times following her disappearance. He had also taken his family to Hodeswood after Sarah had disappeared for a family walk. Records and CCTV confirmed that Wayne had destroyed Sarah's remains with petrol. However, this was not wholly successful. 
her body was recovered and a post-mortem was ordered. The coroner confirmed at their inquest that Sarah had been the victim of homicide. During his interrogation, Wayne told several stories about that evening before finally confessing. It was later found that Wayne had spent weeks, even months, planning the crime. He harnessed his skills as a metropolitan police officer to engineer a situation that would get him with the woman alone. Disturbingly, those who worked with Wayne at the police station would confirm later that he had a reputation and was known to have a misogynist attitude. Following Wayne's arrest, the Metropolitan Police Department found itself at the center of many controversies, as did other police forces across the UK. The entire country waited for Wayne Cousins' trial, which came on June 8, 2021. During his trial at the Old Bailey, Wayne admitted that he'd premeditated the attack. He told the court that in the days before Sarah's disappearance, he had rented a car and bought duct tape and other items for the attack. He also admitted to regularly prowling the streets of Clapham and Brixton, pondering over other possible victims. Sarah's family were spared many elements of the trial by Wayne, who pled guilty on June 9, 2021. Later that year, in what was considered a stunning move, Wayne Cousins was sentenced to a whole-life tariff, which meant that he will never be eligible for parole. In the UK, life sentences often mean 25 years with the possibility of parole. But for Wayne and a handful of the UK's most dangerous criminals, their sentences mean life. Number 4 On Halloween night, 1987, Todd Matthews huddled around his friends as they took turns telling scary stories. The group told tales of demons, phantoms, and ghosts one by one while the fire crackled in the background. Some of their stories ended in laughter, but one story led Todd down a decades-long hunt for justice. When it was time for Lori Riddle to tell her story, she had no idea the impact that it would have on her husband Todd. Lori recalled the tale of the day her father found a body. Lori confirmed that the story was true, and from that moment, Todd knew that he had to seek justice. On May 17, 1968, Wilbur Riddle left his home in Kentucky kissing his wife and children goodbye. Wilbur planned to drive to Route 25 and search the forests and wooded areas for glass insulators. This was a regular activity for Wilbur, who not only enjoyed scavenging, but knew that he could sell the valuables he found. As Wilbur neared Georgetown on Route 25, he hopped out of his car and searched the grasslands. As he stepped through the fields, he saw something up ahead. It was a large green tarp and there was something inside. Terrified, Wilbur nudged the tarp, which sent it barreling down a nearby embankment. As the tarp barreled down, it unraveled, revealing the body of a young woman. In a state of shock, Wilbur ran back to his car and drove to the nearest phone. Within minutes, the sheriff's office arrived at the scene, and an investigation was opened. According to reports from 1968, the woman's body had undergone significant decomposition, leaving it almost unrecognizable. The tarp that she'd been wrapped in led investigators to believe this crime was personal, but first, they'd have to identify their victim. Her body was transported to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. There are varying reports about the autopsy. Some reports state that her body was too decayed to determine how she had passed, while others stated that it was later discovered that she'd passed due to pressure to the neck. The medical examiner's report noted that the woman was around 5 foot to 5 foot 1, 110 to 115 pounds with reddish-brown hair. There were no unique identifiers and a copy of her description and an approximation sketch was circulated around the area. Investigators worked hard to uncover the woman's identity, scouring through recent missing person cases. The sketch and description had prompted many tips and many families had come forward hoping it was their missing loved one. Unfortunately, none of these leads panned out, and the case quickly went cold. The media called her Tent Girl due to the tarps that she'd been found wrapped in. The case of the Tent Girl was present in the minds of the public, but nobody recognized her. As the years blended together, her case quickly became forgotten. In 1971, she was buried in Georgetown Cemetery. Her headstone bore the name Tent Girl and her height, weight, and hair color. Investigators desperately hoped that they would have a real name to place on her headstone, but they knew this investigation needed a lucky break to solve it. 
The FBI was called in to help with the cold case, and the local investigators hoped that FBI technology finally held the answer. A sample of her hair was obtained for comparison, but no matches were found. The body of Doris Dittmar came forward in the years after Tent Girl's discovery, telling the FBI that the description of Jane Doe fit her daughter. The hair sample that had previously been obtained was compared to a sample for Doris, and according to the FBI, it was a match. The FBI made a shocking discovery just days before Doris's family prepared to travel from Maryland to Kentucky. Doris was in fact alive and well living in Pennsylvania. For investigators, this was another crushing blow in a frustrating case. After Tent Girl's burial, her case went cold and was resigned to the back of the pile. That was until 1987 when Todd Matthews heard about her case from his friend Lori Riddle's ghost story. In the 1990s, Lori and Todd began dating and eventually got married. Todd spent many hours with Lori's father, Wilbur, before he plucked up the courage to ask him about Tent Girl. He explained to Wilbur that he'd not stopped thinking about that story since 1987 and was determined to uncover her identity. Wilbur told Todd everything he knew about the case, and from there, Todd began his own investigation. The internet was an emerging tool in 1997, and Todd hoped to use it to his advantage. He'd spent the last few years manually trawling through case files, newspapers, and any pieces of information he could get his hands on. Whenever Todd thought that he'd finally gotten close, his leads would collapse. In 1997, Todd began posting to message boards and forums dedicated to cold cases and missing loved ones. When he had no luck there, he created TentGirl.com, an early website to try and draw attention to her case. Tent Girl's case was known in Kentucky, but Todd believed that she may have been further afield, hence why nobody had identified her yet. His website received a steady stream of emails and messages from families looking for their loved ones, but these leads went nowhere again. Frustrated with the lack of progress, Todd decided to take another look at the message boards in 1998, and this time, he hit the jackpot. One evening, he was scrolling through the forum, and he came across a post from a woman named Rosemary Westbrook from Arkansas. Her post detailed her sister's disappearance, who was last seen in Lexington, Kentucky in 1967. Rosemary also described her sister, and something clicked. Todd realized that Rosemary's sister loosely resembled Tent Girl. With so many leads not panning out, Todd decided to throw caution to the wind and call Rosemary with the news. He explained to her that her sister somewhat resembled a woman found wrapped in a tarp in 1968. Todd and Rosemary were desperate to find answers to their own problems, and Rosemary agreed to ask the FBI and the local sheriff's office to exhume Tent Girl for a DNA test. Rosemary and Todd held their breath. In 1998, DNA was an emerging technology, and it oftentimes took weeks, even months, for DNA samples to be sequenced. In April of 1998, Rosemary and Todd received the call that they had been waiting for. Tent Girl was officially identified as 24-year-old Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor, who was last seen in Lexington, Kentucky in 1967. According to Rosemary, at the time of her disappearance, Barbara was living with her husband Earl Taylor in Lexington, and the marriage was said to be troubled. There are reports that Earl was violent and abusive towards Barbara, and that she was planning on fleeing from him with her child. Sometime in 1967, Barbara mysteriously disappeared, and Earl told Barbara's friends and family that she had an affair with another man and had run away. In other iterations of the story, it was said that Barbara had moved to Florida to escape her husband. Unfortunately, Earl passed away in 1987, taking whatever information he had with him to the grave. Todd, Rosemary, and Barbara's family believe Earl was likely involved in what happened to Barbara. He was known to have a wicked temper and would lash out at Barbara for no reason. Following her identification, Tint Girl's headstone was changed to Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor, loving mother, grandmother, and sister. Todd Matthews went on to aid in the formation of the Doe Network, an organization that aims to identify the nameless. Number 3 28 year old Samantha Lazark was described as a sweet and kind woman. She was well-liked in her Wichita Falls, Texas community, and she held a special bond with her mother, Sharon Keith. By 2002, 
Samantha had hit a rough patch, but she was determined to dust herself off and get back on her feet again. While there were dark days, there were also glimmers of hope for Samantha. She had a chance encounter online that would lead detectives down a mysterious rabbit hole. After graduating high school, Samantha Lazark married her high school sweetheart, John Lazark. Those around them believed that the relationship would withstand the test of time, but unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. By 2002, the marriage had disintegrated after John had an affair with Samantha's best friend. The divorce was especially hard on Samantha, who believed her ex-husband was the one. In the months after her divorce, Samantha began taking care of herself again and hoped to move on with her life. She worked at a supermarket in Wichita Falls and was well-liked by her co-workers. They knew of her impending divorce and did everything they could to support their friend. Just when Samantha got on her feet again, her ex-husband would appear in her life again and Samantha finally built up the courage to kick her husband out for good. In early 2003, Samantha dipped her toe into the world of online dating. In 2003, online dating was nothing like it is today. There was no Tinder or Bumble and people usually met one another through chat rooms or forums. Samantha preferred the latter, going by the screen name MeowMix28. Her profile reflected her bubbly personality and love of tattoos and cats, and she quickly amassed messages from interested partners. According to Sharon, Samantha's mother, her ex-husband John was infuriated that Samantha had started dating again. He even warned her that she could cross paths with dangerous people a bizarre foreshadowing of what was to come. Samantha ignored her ex-husband's jealous outbursts and began going on dates, allowing them to come into her home. Samantha's life would take a dramatic turn on January 6, 2003, when she failed to show up for work at the supermarket. Her co-worker, Lori, and her husband, Donnie, knew something was wrong. Samantha was a devoted employee who would only have skipped work if calling in first. The pair sensed something wasn't right and immediately drove to her home. When they approached the front door, they discovered that it was unlocked. When they walked inside, they discovered a gruesome scene that would haunt them forever. Samantha was found lying on her back with a cord around her neck. The pair dashed for Samantha's home phone and called the Wichita Falls Police Department to the scene. The WFPD uncovered something very bizarre at the crime scene. While there was a sign of a struggle and several pieces of evidence with bodily fluids and DNA all over them, there was no sign of forced entry. The cord that had been used to attack Samantha had been knotted in a specific way, which led investigators to believe that her attacker may have had a military background. A laser pointer was also found on the bed and there was no sign of a robbery. The scene puzzled investigators and they believed that Samantha had been attacked by someone she knew, but who? Their first suspect was John Lazard, Samantha's ex-husband. Not only had the two gotten divorced following John's affair, but they had also discovered that the two had been wrapped up in a fight over health insurance. In the months after their split, Samantha had threatened to cut off John's health insurance, something that he desperately needed. When he was 18, he was struck by a falling car, which left him with long-term complications. Investigators pondered whether this has led John to take revenge against his ex-wife. John submitted to several interviews and provided DNA samples and fingerprints for comparison. Incredibly, testing showed that the fingerprints and DNA found at the scene did not belong to John. So who did it? Lori, Samantha's friend, told investigators about her venture into online dating, and investigators had a breakthrough. If John hadn't been the one to attack Samantha, perhaps one of her dates may have. They began trawling through endless chat room logs of Samantha's conversations with various men. Investigators found several possible suspects, including men who went by the monikers K.S. and Kristoff. These men submitted DNA samples and fingerprints, and they were found not to be a match to the crime scene. Investigators were slowly running out of leads until a tip came in of a red and black motorcycle parked outside of Samantha's home on January 6th. This tip proved vital, and according to the WFPD, they used the terms motorcycle and bike to search through Samantha's chat logs. This led them to pages of correspondence with a man by the name of I. M. Elliot. Using information from their conversations and his profile, the WFPD submitted a search warrant to obtain Chris's DNA and fingerprints. After weeks of rigorous testing, it was found that Chris's fingerprints and DNA 
matched the crime scene. Chris Russell was swiftly arrested and charged in Samantha's case. The evidence against Chris was overwhelming, and in 2005, he was found guilty. He was sentenced to 99 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Number 2 41-year-old Charles Holden had just finished his shift in Harrington, Delaware on June 23, 1991, and he was looking forward to getting home and putting his feet up. At around 12.30 p.m. before heading home, Charles drove his truck into a stop along U.S. Highway 13 and State Highway 14 and headed for the Hardee's restaurant. Charles went about his usual routine of ordering a burger and a coffee, savoring his midnight snack as he relaxed. Charles had become a regular at the restaurant and spoke to the staff on duty. After finishing up, Charles bid everyone good night and headed back to his truck to make the short drive home to the trailer on the plot of land that he shared with his 72-year-old mother, Dorothy Donovan. Dorothy mainly lived in the farmhouse, but the two would regularly visit each other's homes. Just before Charles stepped into the cab of his truck, he was accosted by a stranger. The man explained that he really needed a ride to the nearby Milford Memorial Hospital. Not wanting to leave the man out in the cold without a ride, Charles agreed to take the stranger as far as he could before he needed to drive home. But the stranger wasn't happy with this. He began shouting at Charles, demanding that he take him all the way to the hospital. Charles eventually managed to calm the man down and the two began driving toward the hospital. When Charles reached Killen Pond Road, he told the stranger that this was as far as he would take him, as previously agreed. This only reignited the fuel inside the stranger, who continued to demand that Charles carry on driving. Again, Charles did his best to calm him down, but Charles' negotiation failed this time. The man began punching and hitting Charles, displaying a frightening rage. The stranger reached around at his feet and pulled out a screwdriver that Charles had left in the cab. Charles immediately ran off, but the man followed him, shouting that he would catch him. Charles tried to cry for help, but it was now 12.30 a.m. and nobody was around. The two danced around the cab outside, desperately trying to outsmart one another. That was when Charles had a brilliant idea. The stranger had previously tried to drive away in the truck, but Charles had the keys. He lured the stranger further out before dashing back to the cab with keys in hand. By a stroke of luck, Charles managed to jump into the truck and get it started at the last second. As he drove away, he saw the mysterious stranger jumping around angrily in his rearview mirror. Charles considered himself extremely lucky and took a moment to reflect on what had just happened. Charles knew the man would probably follow him home, so he drove through winding roads and back alleys to throw off his trail. An hour after he'd been severely attacked, Charles felt safe enough to return home. But this was just the beginning of his ordeal. As the truck slowly rolled to a stop just outside of his trailer, Charles saw a figure illuminated in the headlights. It was the man from before. Fearing for his life, Charles locked his truck and drove to call for help. Unfortunately, it took the Delaware State Police two hours to respond to the incident. All the while, Charles remained in his truck waiting for help. When the Delaware State Police finally arrived, they swept the trailer and the property. By then, the madman from before was long gone, and Charles' trailer had no noticeable damage. After checking Charles' trailer, the Delaware State Police decided to check Dorothy's home, which sat on the same farmland as Charles' trailer. They discovered a shocking scene when they opened the door and headed inside. Dorothy was laid in her bed, deceased. A back window had been broken, but other than that, there were no signs of forced entry or robbery. The Delaware State Police immediately turned their suspicions on Charles. Charles had no proof that he'd been accosted by a man at a Hardee's, and investigators discovered that Dorothy had a life insurance policy that would pay out to Charles. Even Charles's family began to turn on him, believing that he'd concocted a wild story to get away with the perfect crime. There was no physical evidence to prove Charles's involvement, and evidence collection was difficult as Charles had been in his mother's home almost every day. Without any physical evidence, the case went cold, but investigators kept a close eye on Charles, as did his family. Years would pass without word, and Charles became estranged from his siblings due to the crime. Then, in 2004, the Delaware State Police submitted DNA evidence from the crime scene to criminal databases. Within weeks, they had a match. 
41-year-old Gilbert Cannon. When the Delaware State Police brought in Gilbert Cannon, they realized not only did he bear a strong resemblance to the sketch that Charles had made, but he had had several previous arrests. During questioning, Gilbert confessed to taking Dorothy's life and being the man who attacked Charles in 1991. According to Gilbert, he'd not planned on arriving at Charles's home, calling it a bizarre coincidence. He confessed that he was under the influence at the time. In 2007, Gilbert was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 1. Patricia Kimmy had a special bond with her daughter, Rita Baller. Patricia lived in a rural community in Horton, Kansas, and was described as a loving grandmother to her grandchildren. In 1971, Patricia married her high school sweetheart, Eugene, and the two began a family together. Unfortunately, their relationship was doomed from the start. Eugene was known to be exceptionally cruel towards Patricia, and nothing she ever did was good enough. It would take Patricia decades to build up the courage to divorce Eugene in 2008, a decision he was extremely unhappy about. Eugene went around the community of Horton, telling everyone who would listen about his bitter ex-wife and how he wanted her out of the picture. So when Patricia mysteriously disappeared, all eyes fell on Eugene. On November 7, 2009, Patricia, her daughter Rita, and her grandchildren had planned an afternoon shopping trip in Horton, but Patricia never showed up. Rita immediately knew something was wrong and rushed to her mother's home. As she approached the front porch, she found disturbing clues. Red droplets lined the porch, and part of the gate had been broken off. Patricia's home showed signs of a struggle, and her phone was still inside, ringing out. Rita contacted the Aitchison County Sheriff's Office, which responded to the incident immediately. She reiterated that she hadn't seen or heard from her mother that day and was extremely worried about her. She had arrived at her home to see if she was okay when met by the scene. Officers calmed Rita down while a forensic team was sent to the house. As the forensic teams were sweeping the area, they came across a sailor insurance baseball cap, a money clip, coins, and Patricia's dentures around a quarter of a mile to half a mile from Patricia's house. The money clip and coins were covered in the same red droplets from the porch of her home. Investigators knew that Patricia had met with foul play, but the question was, where was her body? Patricia's family were informed of the news, and their world fell apart. Rita explained that besides her ex-husband Eugene, Patricia had no enemies. The fight between Patricia and Eugene had been reignited in recent months as Patricia began receiving her alimony payments. The divorce settlement also required Eugene to forfeit some of his land to his ex-wife, which infuriated him. Eugene had been watching Patricia from afar and was displeased to see how well she was doing without him. Investigators turned their focus on Eugene and brought him in for questioning. During his interrogation, Eugene admitted to making inflammatory comments about his divorce, but claimed that he'd now moved on and was seeing someone else. His girlfriend would later tell investigators that the two were home on the evening of the crime, watching TV. Investigators were dubious of Eugene's alibi, but so far, they had not uncovered enough evidence to bring about a conviction. The Aitchison County Sheriff's Office continued its investigation, closely examining those who knew Patricia. Despite a lengthy investigation, nothing significant was found. The Sheriff's Office believed that Patricia's case would likely go cold until they received an important call. A witness who had been near Patricia's home that evening recalled seeing a distinctive red pickup truck near her home on the night of the crime. He claimed that the truck stuck out due to the dual rear tires on each side. The Sheriff's Office believed that the truck may have been a coincidence, but with little evidence to work with, they gave it a shot. The witness also described seeing two legs kicking from behind the truck. Despite the distinctive features, the tip about the red truck fizzled out, and investigators were back at square one. One eagle-eyed investigator decided to take another look at the tidbits of evidence found half a mile from Patricia's home. When they picked up the cap, they noticed the aforementioned name, Sailor Insurance, on the front. The sheriff's office asked Patricia's family if this hat or company meant anything to them, and that's when the case came alive. Patricia's family told investigators that a man named Roger Hollister drove a red pickup truck just like the one described by the witness, and was also familiar with Patricia and Eugene. During his interrogation, Roger professed his innocence, saying that he had nothing to do with what happened to Patricia. 
he confirmed that the two knew each other but were nothing more than acquaintances. Investigators watched as the lead slowly began to fizzle out before their eyes. That was until Patricia's son and nephew approached the police with a new angle. The word around town was that Roger had been spotted at a nearby sawmill, but Roger wasn't alone. He was talking to Eugene. Witnesses overheard Roger screaming at Eugene for the money he owed him, for taking care of business. According to Oxygen, this tip was enough for investigators to obtain a search warrant for Roger's home. The search commenced days later, with Roger anxiously overlooking the crime scene. After days of hard work and digging, investigators came across the remains of a burnt-out and buried red truck, incredibly similar to the one last seen outside of Patricia's home. This wasn't the only evidence they recovered, though. DNA samples were obtained and sent to the lab for testing. Days later, investigators confirmed that the DNA found in the sailor insurance hat matched Roger Hollister. Roger was arrested and charged in connection with the case. In a shocking twist, Rebecca Hollister came forward with some troubling information just days after her husband was found guilty. She revealed to investigators that she knew where Patricia's body was and why her husband had buried and burned his car. In exchange for a better deal and wanting to do the right thing, Rebecca led investigators to where Patricia had been buried. After excavating the area, they found Patricia's partial remains, confirming that the Hollisters had been involved. During his trial, the prosecution stated that they believed Eugene Kimmy had given Roger $70,000 to take out his wife. Unfortunately, the hit-for-hire angle has too little evidence to back it up, and it doesn't appear as though the money changed hands. Rebecca later revealed that she watched her husband bury and burn the car, promising to keep it a secret. In 2011, Roger Hollister stood trial, where he pleaded not guilty to all charges. With insurmountable evidence against him, the jury found Roger guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. Rebecca Hollister also faced charges. Just two years into his life sentence, Roger passed away, age 61. Eugene was never charged in his ex-wife's case due to a lack of evidence. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.